So yeah, each question can be either true, false, or unanswered. So this is assuming that if you do not answer a question, you can still answer the following question. Right? Sure. If you were to make it so that if you were to not answer that question, that would be the last question to answer. You're thinking of it like like a quick online quiz or something. Yes. Oh. Um, I mean, I, 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 I did three three hundred, but I'm wondering if it was a. If it was so a okay, so this one first. To answer hundred questions, it's a hundred tasks. Each question can be answered three ways, so it's three times three times three, three to hundred. If not answering ends your test, though, then you have I don't know. There's a few ways I could see to do it. You have two to the hundredth, assuming you answer everything. If you don't answer the last question, you've got 2 to the 99th. If you don't answer the 98th question, you've got 2 to the 98th. And you can complete your test that way, or that way, or that way. So you can use a sum rule, um, or a product rule for each case. I think that would work. That makes sense. Okay. And that would be easy to compute, actually, because it would be like 2 to the 101st. And I'm thinking that's going to be significant. Is that going to be significantly less than that? Yeah, this will be around 2 to the 101. So about twice 2 to the 100, which is a lot less than 3 to the 100th. Yeah. Because, you know, there's a ton of stuff that you aren't going to account for. Like, if you left the first question not answered, but everything else was answered true or false. You have two sets there. You have a whole bunch that you want to count for. So it's 1.5 to the hundredth times larger. So yeah, big number. Yay. Big numbers are, are interesting. There's a whole science to how to work with big numbers and how to write them. Goes way beyond weighted positional. Yeah. <laughs> um, assuming initials are taken from uppercase letters, how many three letter initials are possible? Um, A through Z, 26 options for the first initial, 26 for the second, 26 for the third. That's a straight product rule. Question three, same thing, but you can't repeat. 26 ways to pick the first initial, 25 for the second, 24 for the third. So it's the number of, of three combination, three permutations. Which is also this. Question four was a pigeonhole question. A set S consists of positive integers, no two of which are congruent to each other, mod 17. What's the maximum number of elements in the set S? So make yourself buckets based on congruence, mod 17. And we know that everything is congruent with one of these 17 things. Mod 17, <coughs> there's 17 buckets, and you have n integers. And now the question is, how many elements can we place into these buckets such that no bucket contains more than one element? Because if we put two numbers into the same bucket, they're both congruent to the same thing, so they're congruent to each other. So you have 17 buckets, what's the largest number of integers you can put in there? is 17. So the answer here is just 17. If you have fewer than 17, are you guaranteed that they're not congruent to each other? Absolutely not. I could get 0, 17, and 34, and they'd all go in that bucket. But I can find three positive integers that will go into three different buckets. I can find four, I can find five, I can actually find 17. But it's not possible to find 18. So 17 is the maximum uh, possible size. All right, question.
question five, the set consists of 10 elements. How many subsets of size less than or equal to four? So products and sums. Suppose we want to find a set of exactly four elements. How many possible subsets are there? So how can we describe the task of forming a subset of four elements? Um, it's a four combination of ten. Okay, why? How do we describe that in words? Because uh, you don't care about the order, you just need four different numbers out mm -hmm. of a set of ten. Okay, so we're going to pick the first element, we're going to pick the second element, we're going to pick the third element, we're going to pick the fourth element. And we don't care about the order because ABCD is the same set as DCBA. So this is actually and choose four possible subsets. Or we could pick three elements, ten choose three ways, two elements, one element. this one? Empty set. That's the empty set, no elements. That is a subset. N men and N women being arranged in a row such that men and women alternate. How many different ways can these people be arranged? So let's do a sub question. You just have N men, you want to put them in a row. How many different ways can we do that? It's the same as picking a C. Yeah. N factorial. N factorial, right? The first person in the row, you have N options for that. The second person, you have N minus 1. Third, N minus 2 down to the last person, you have no choice. So if it was just n men or n women, it would be n factorial. So you have n men and n women, it's going to be at least n factorial ways. And it's going to be more than two, because they're distinct. But you need to use a little bit of a sum rule here. So it's going to be a man, a woman, if they order like that, you've got a total of 2n. So how many ways can we pick this first person? Uh, n. That's n. How many ways can we pick the first woman? N. That's n. Second man? N minus 1. N minus 1. Second woman? Right, multiply all of those. This is n factorial times n factorial, which is n factorial squared. But you're not done. There's still one point more. You can do women first. You can do women first. So this is n factorial squared. This is n factorial squared. And we can do either this or this, so you add them. So it's 2n factorial squared. All right, and last question was Pascal's triangle. And we talked about the entries of Pascal's triangle corresponding to binomial coefficients. 1 plus x is a binomial terms, two monomials. Um, and when you raise a monomial, a binomial to a power, you get this big long expression. The coefficient in front of each term corresponds to the entries from Pascal's triangle. 
And we saw that sort of by waving our hands and saying the number of ways that we can come up with x to the seventh out of 11 of these one plus x's multiplied together. So the quick answer is just this. But a number of people wrote out Pascal's triangle and then picked out the right term that works too. But this is just 11 factorial over 7 factorial times 4 factorial. And that turns out to be 330. Times 4 factorial? Say what? Where's the times 4 factorial coming from? 11 minus 7. So in our. Oh, okay. This was giving us permutations, and this was dividing out the number of ways that we could get the same answer. Or this was permutations. This was the number of ways. It's not too bad, so... So the 7 factorial eats up all of this. Oh, okay. 4 factorial is 24, so I do 11 times 10. I'll do 9 is 3 times 3 times 8. And there's my 4 factorial. So you're left with 33 times 10, 330. Wait, I'm sorry. How is three, how is three times eight? Four factorial? Four factorial is 24. Four factorial is 24. Oh, right. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. It would be a little easier if you changed it to three times, yeah. four times three times two. Right. Yeah, there's 11 does. times 10 times 9 times 8. So there's two, there's three, and, the other two. and there's four. Okay. I guess it's easier to follow. It's fun to do these because like everything cancels. It's like take a red pattern. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we were looking at trees. Um, and for your homework you need to be able to do a recursion tree. So let me talk about recursion trees first. Um, this is this is a problem we'll we'll dig into in a lot more detail next term. But um, talk about 
about the knapsack problem. I might have mentioned this briefly. Um, but here's the idea. You have a bag that can hold, say, 20 pounds worth of goods. And you want to fill it with as much value as possible. So you go into a room and there's an inventory of items. So, um, I don't know what we got. We've got pencils, which weigh um, one ounce and are worth a dollar each. We've got a cell phone, which weighs five ounces and is worth $600. No, I'm not to make it worth twenty dollars, it's a Samsung. No, sorry. Um, we've got a laptop which weighs ten ounces and is worth six dollars. <laughs> and we want one more thing in here. What do we want? We have a mouse. And we want to fit the most amount of the things. Which weighs two ounces and is worth. Uh, and we want to fit the most amount of stuff in there as efficiently as possible. Right? Exactly. And as so we, we, as we put these. one thing in, we remove that from the total available space. Yeah, you did cover this, actually. Okay. So let's say the capacity of this bag is 20. 20 ounces? 20 ounces, yeah. All these are ounces. I took them off because it looks like it has zero. Um, capacity is 20, and we want to know how do we get the most value into this bag? Are there multiple of there's an unlimited number of okay, each of these. Say, you could just put one yeah. in bag and you could so there's there's an infinite supply of these. So I mean, we could get 20 pencils, we'd have $20 worth of stuff. We could get four cell phones, we'd have $80 worth of stuff. We could get a laptop and two cell phones, and we'd have uh, $52 worth of stuff. And the answer is fairly obvious here, right? Because the cell phone is so much more valuable. But um, but in general, you can't find a quick solution to this. You can't just take the thing that's most valuable per weight and fill up on that. Um, and I'm always horrible at coming up with examples of that, but, but I can. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how do we get the maximum value out of this, this 20 ounce capacity? And here's how we can do this recursively. Okay, so we can say, um, Let's make a function in pseudocode called nap. Yeah? So, why can't it just be simply the most valuable thing? Like, what if, it, if, if it just doesn't fit, like there's room left over, you just go before, then you go to the next most valuable thing. It doesn't thing. always work. And like I say, I'm horrible at coming up with examples where that doesn't work on the fly. What if the most valuable thing is really, really heavy, and you have a lot of smaller things that are slim, similarly valuable? I mean, like yeah. price to performance ratio. If you all yeah. make it a ratio... We'll it won't, it won't work best. because we can't take fractions. But then you take the... Instead, you just go to the highest you can, possibly, yeah. and then just take the next most valuable thing. Right, so if our capacity was six then we could fit one of these, but we might have something that weighs three and is almost worth 20, but we could fit two of them. And if yeah. it's worth more than half of this, it's still gonna end up being not as valuable per ounce. But because we can fit two of them and we can't fit 1.2 of these, we'll end up being better taking that lighter thing, the thing that's not as valuable. And you can concoct examples. Like I said, I just have a hard time doing it on the fly. Okay. So here's how we can solve it. Um, make a function called knapsack. You give it a capacity, it returns the maximum value. Okay, so return max value possible. Okay, we need a base case. If our capacity is zero or negative, we turn to zero.
otherwise, we have exactly four possibilities. Case one. Add a pencil. If we add a pencil to our bag, we do two things. One, we increase our current value by a dollar. And two, we decrease our capacity by one ounce. Agreed? So we start off, we've got an empty bag that can hold capacity. We throw one pencil in. Our capacity goes down by one. Our value of our contents of our bag goes up by one. So add a pencil, total maximum value equals one dollar plus the maximum value we can get out of a bag that has one ounce less carrying capacity. cell phone instead of a pencil, the maximum possible value we can get out of that bag now is the value of the cell phone we put in there plus whatever the maximum value is from a bag whose capacity is diminished by five ounces. combination is just even my first item is either a pencil, cell phone, laptop, or mouse. So I just got to compute the answer for those four cases, pick the largest one, and there's our answer. So case three um, will be six dollars plus nap of capacity minus ten, and case four will be four dollars plus the maximum we can get from a capacity diminished by two. And then at the very end, you have to figure out what the largest total max value is, mm -hmm. and that'll that'll propagate recursively, and you'll always yeah. get the max value. Recursively. Right. Yeah. So I just calculate these four, pick the largest one. That's my answer. We will not get the correct answer until we reach all the, we put all of them in the, each case. And yes. And sub cases. Um, all I got to do is these four calculations. And we turn the largest. But in order to do this calculation, I've got to call my knapsack function. And it's going to do its own set of calculations. Okay, so it's going to be like the question we had in the question for Fibonacci. Yeah. Yeah. So really simple recursive functions are right. Really inefficient to run. Okay, you put in 10, 15 items and this will never come back. It's really grossly inefficient. But pretty simple to write. Is this like, okay, like apparently there are algorithms for going between different points. Mm-hmm. And finding the most efficient way to go through a bunch of different points is really hard. Yes. Apparently, is this the same thing? That's an understatement. No, this one's not that bad. Um, you're probably talking about traveling salesperson problem, which I is. I don't know what it's called. I just read that somewhere. Yeah, that. that's like an n factorial problem. So we're going to talk about traveling salesperson later, but we can mention it now. So TS, the question is, you have N cities, and you want to start at a particular city and visit every other city. And there's a distance from each point to every other point, and you want to know what's the most efficient way to visit all these cities. What's the shortest total path that lets you go from point A through every other city? And it's N factorial possibilities. So to simply try every possible path is very expensive. 
and factorial time. Yes. So for 100 cities, good luck. <laughs> um, and you can approximate it, and you can get within, say, you know, half percent of your best solution in much better time. But to solve the general travel and salesperson problem, it's a huge area of research. Um, and it's a really popular area for so-called amateur mathematicians and computer scientists. Because again, it's one of these problems that's like really enticing, it's really easy to describe, and you can imagine how to start trying to tackle it. Um, but it's so phenomenally difficult that it's actually been proven that if you can solve that problem in what's called polynomial time, something like n squared or n cubed versus n factorial, you can change the world. Because if you can solve TS in polynomial time, there's a big list of other problems that you can also solve in polynomial time. And that's something called P equals NP. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there's actually a movie on Amazon, I think, called P equals NP. And it talks about a group of mathematicians who solve this problem. And it's a really weird movie. And half the movie is spent like staring at a clock on the wall ticking like, during moments of tense silence. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's a fascinating uh, question. And it's an open question. Nobody knows if you can do it or not. But most, uh, most journals have restrictions on whether or not they'll accept papers claiming to prove this. And they'll only accept like one paper every two years from a certain person, stuff like that. <laughs> it's a really famous problem. Yeah? So if you can estimate it accurately enough, or at all, if you can estimate it to just 50%, that mm -hmm. should narrow down the possibility space and you could get a valid answer, right? I don't think so. No? You can get a solution that's, yeah, I mean, it should, it should narrow down some of the options. For example, if you know you can do this in less than a thousand miles, then you shouldn't start by going to a city that's more than a thousand miles away. So you cut your space down dramatically, sure, but apparently you still can't get to a polynomial time. So this is, this is not as bad, but it, it is ugly. Um, but like I say, the solution itself, pretty straightforward. So we can use a tree to capture the behavior of a recursive algorithm like this. And this is what I call a recursion tree in the homework. So here's how this works. We're trying to solve this problem for the capacity of 20. To do that, we need to solve four subproblems. Capacity of 19, which is where we add a pencil. Capacity of 15, where we add a cell phone. Capacity of 10, where we add a laptop. And capacity of 18, where we add a mouse. Once we know the value of our function for each of these points, we can do our simple calculations. This value plus 1, this plus 20, this plus 6, this plus 4. Pick the maximum and we're done. In order to compute the function's value at 19, we need to do four possible cases. We need to diminish it by 1, diminish it by 5, diminish it by 10, and diminish it by 2. And in order to do 18, we need to do four subcases, diminished by 1, diminished by 5, diminished by 10, and diminished by 2. And you can see what's starting to happen here. We haven't even looked at these cases yet. We haven't looked at these cases. I'm just kind of following this leftmost branch. And I'm getting all kinds of, of pain and suffering. And you're just going to go down until less than zero, right? And we're going to go down all the way until we get down to zero. And that's going to come back immediately without any recursion and say maximum value is zero. And then we can start coming down other routes. So eventually, we might come back to here and come down here to the case of 12. And for 12, we're going to have four cases also. 
right? Diminished by 1, diminished by 5, diminished by 10, and diminished by 2. And we got to go down all of those. Grossly inefficient seems like kind of yeah. undertaking. <laughs> yes, definitely. But we can draw a tree like this to understand how the system is going to call this routine, how this routine is going to call itself over and over again. Now, in this case, I'm not going to draw the whole thing out because I think it has around 4 to the 20th nodes. I was thinking if we have, because you like the one in the uh, homework, mm -hmm. can, is there any way to like link to one of those subtrees because they are going to just repeat each other? Yes. And that's something we'll do next term. It's called dynamic programming. For example, um, kind of like caching your results. Yeah, caching your results exactly like that. For example, once I compute this value seven, I don't need to go down all the branches to find this value seven. The first time that I calculate this, I just save it in memory. And when I'm evaluating my function at a particular value, I check my memory cache and see if I've already done this. Wouldn't that be as easy as just making a 20 unit long array? And that's all it is. Yeah, that's what you got. And basically, when I start off down here, I'll come down this left branch, I will calculate all of my functions. And I won't actually get an answer until I come down here and I get to zero. But once I come up here and I get to 16, when I pop up here, I'll already have done 12 and 7 and 15. So those will just come back right away from memory. And when I come up here, I'll have 13, 8, and 16. That trims off a lot. That takes you to order n, basically. 20 yeah. capacity, you'll do 20 calculations. Wow. Yeah. So then you go from something that takes 2 to the 40th operations to 20 operations. So we'll play around with that. Um, the essential point for this class is just the idea that we can use a tree to represent this call structure. But but that's one of the the idea of caching memory is one of the ways that you were saying that you could combine recursion and some other concepts to make an efficient thing that's easy to write. Yes. Right? Yes. Cool. All right. So we won't finish this out because that's ten to the twenty-fourth possible nodes. I think so. Two to the fortieth. Uh, four branches on each level and twenty levels. Okay. So four to the twentieth. That's two to the fortieth. Right. Four is two okay. squared, which is two to the tenth to the fourth, which is a thousand to the fourth. Oh, you're just talking about the left, left, left side. No. Nah, well, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> It kind of dominates the rest of the equation. So it's not that bad. It's a million million. <laughs> so let's look at this for Fibonacci's. Um, let's just look at Fibonacci 4. So to calculate the fourth Fibonacci number, we need to calculate the third and the second. To calculate the third, we need to calculate the second and the first. And to calculate the first, we need to calculate the second, we need to calculate the first and um, the zero. So it started like this. And to calculate two, we need to calculate one and zero. And these, in this case, are our base cases. Think of your homework, I start with one and two. But in this example, our base cases are F0 and F1. So we can calculate these without doing any other recursions. Once you know these, you can find 2. Once you know 2 and 1, you can find 3. 1 and 0 gives you 2, and those give you 4. And so in this case, we're doing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 recursive calls. Find F4. If we wanted to do F5, we need to find these. I'm going to postulate that for Fn, we have roughly 2 to the n minus 1. Just looking at this, F4 was giving us 2 cubed 
possibilities. So if we know this is true, then to calculate Fn plus 1, we need to calculate Fn and Fn minus 1. And this will be 2 to the n, and this will be 2 to the n minus 1. And it's not a super clean formula. But it's ballpark 2 to the n. Again, if you use dynamic programming, this becomes a lot easier. Once we calculate what F2 is, we don't need to do all of this to find F2 over here. We just pull it out of memory. So these kinds of, of trees show you what you're in for with a recursive algorithm. Now when we compute factorials, when we wanted to compute 6 factorial, we had to first compute 5 factorial and then multiply by 6. To find 5 factorial, we needed to find 4 and multiply by 5. And 1 factorial was our base case. So we're only recursing 5 or 6 times here. This is like an order n situation. It's not blowing up the way Fibonacci's or knapsack problem was. What would a triangle number recursion tree look like? Same thing. Kind of similar to this one, right? Yeah, so... Uh, so I was trying to think of how that worked in my head. Yeah, it seems good to be... So if n is 1, return 1, otherwise return n plus triangle n minus 1. Yeah. It's the same thing. In fact, the recursive code is identical. You just change 1 multiplication to an addition. Gotcha. So to compute 6, you need 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So those are linearly consuming resources. Not too bad. Did you ever play 20 questions? Too many times. Too many times. So one person thinks of something, the other person's allowed to ask 20 yes-no questions, and they have to try to guess what your thing was that you were thinking of. So is it a lie, yes or no? Is it hard? Uh, does it move? Things like that. So we can take that kind of decision-making process and capture that in a tree capture it, but mimic it in a tree to some degree. So, um, is it alive? Yes. No. Does it bark? I'm going back to dogs if I can. Of course. Yes, it's a dog. No, it's a cat. It's a weird world. It is. <laughs> it's a simpler world. <laughs> is it alive? No. Um, is it fried? Is it, is it, is it, is it <laughs> Does it light up? Yes. It's a phone. No, it's bacon. No. <laughs> it's bacon. You can't even hear about the house. So there's, there's a decision tree that will play not 20 questions, but two questions with us. <laughs> so for a decision tree, you can have um, questions on the same level be different, so does it bark and does it light up, those don't have to be the same? Correct. Yeah, because you don't want to ask if something dead barks. Right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we can play this game, right? So this tells you how to play. So is it alive? And you say yes, and I say does it bark? And you say no, and I say it's a cat. Right? And I looked really smart, except it wasn't a cat, it was a bird. Okay, so now I say, okay, how would I tell the difference between a cat and a bird? Well, a bird flies. Okay, so instead of changing this to an answer, I change it to a question. Does it fly? And if yes, then it's a bird. And if no, then it's a cat. And my decision tree just got a little smarter. 
Yes. <laughs> so you can capture this behavior with something like a tree, right? And that's and just like inserting a number into a binary search tree of a yeah. regular number. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not ordered like a search tree, but we can play this game where we get to a leaf that's an answer. If the answer is correct, we're good. If it's not, we can replace it with another node that has two other leaves. So we'll do this in 223. We'll build a 20 question system. And we can see it with a database. There's a database out there that somebody started. They just put this up on a website and let people play it, and it records their answers, builds the database, and it's a really good database at this point. Akinator? Uh, yeah, I played that. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember I what the site was that it came from, but it's good. It knows about like unicorns and rainbows yeah. and, and bacon and dogs it's and all that stuff. It's probably That thing seems like magic. Yeah. That's crazy. And you can buy these, right, at Toys R Us. You can get yeah. this in a little thing for like 20 bucks, and it plays 20 questions with you. And 20 levels, yes, no questions, how many leaves do you have? Two to the 20th. All right, so that's a million possible things you can differentiate just 20 questions. It's a pretty good database. All right, so that's another thing we can do with trees. Um, I'll talk tomorrow a little bit about um, other ways to traverse trees. Um, we'll talk about depth first versus breadth first and how we can um, how we can actually implement recursive algorithms using trees. Um, and we'll talk a little about stacks again. And then I'll switch over and start talking about graphs. And we'll spend the rest of the week talking about graphs, graph properties, when graphs are the same or different, um, paths in graphs, um, traveling salesperson, and we'll talk about some algorithms for doing things like um, finding the shortest way to visit all the nodes in a graph, stuff like that. Um, and that'll fill us out for the rest of the week. Next week is short. So I may talk a little bit about order of complexity and then I want to spend the rest of the class talking about languages and grammar. So that'll be the last week, maybe a week and a few days. Are you gonna leave the homework due Wednesday or are you gonna push it out that you're talking about? Um, that's all you need to know about recursion trees and all the other stuff I think you could do. So yeah, try and get it in Wednesday. The Fibonacci one's pretty straightforward to do. All right, I will see you next time.